I could talk about how Peter said you could cease from your sin, like in 1 Peter 4. Or I could talk about how Jesus said, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Or I could talk about how Paul told Timothy, a bishop or an elder must be blameless. But I wanted to approach this issue from a different perspective. Because a lot of people, when they hear the word perfect, there's a lot of baggage attached to that. There's a lot of false ideas of what that means that are attached to that. Like, for example, some people say, okay, then you never stub your toe. If you can be perfect, does that mean you never slip up or make a mistake or fall down or something like that? Uh, and other people, they they may just get confused with growth and maturity because there is a sanctification process. There's no denying that. Now, it's not like the false system teaches how we just continue sinning and sinning, and then over years or decades, we slowly sin less and less until maybe we stop that sin. No, that's not at all what sanctification process is. There is a growth process as far as growing in the fruits of the Spirit. And the things listed in 2 Peter chapter 1, we grow in things like knowledge, godliness, uh, love. There is a growth, but it's not that we just keep sinning. Okay, that's not what it is. But people get confused and they say, well, so then that doesn't mean you're perfect if you're not mature. So I just wanted to approach this from a little bit different of an angle. Instead of talking about whether we can be perfect, what if we ask the question, can you be faithful? Like Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, he says, the wives of deacons must be faithful in all things. So right here, he very clearly states a deacon's wife can be faithful in all things. In fact, it's a requirement for her to be a deacon's wife. So he says that it is possible to be faithful, and, and not only faithful, but faithful in all things. And this is the angle I really wanted to approach it today, is from the angle of faithfulness. The Bible talks about faithfulness uh, all throughout the New Testament and even the Old. But let's just look at Colossians 3.20 through 22. Here's this phrase, in all things. And it's in reference to children obeying their parents. It says, children obey your parents in all things. So that implies that it is possible for children to obey their parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And then it says, bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. You see, this is how, this is how I wanted to look at it, is can you be faithful to your parents? Can, can a child be faithful to their parents? Now, it doesn't mean that they're mature. It doesn't mean that their fruit is completely mature. It doesn't mean that they're mature in knowledge. It doesn't mean that they know everything. But can you be faithful as a child? Meaning that when your parents tell you to do something, you do it. You don't, they don't have to argue with you. Uh, they don't, they can count on you. They don't have to worry about you just going off and doing your own thing. Well, yes, that is possible for you to be faithful as a child. Again, it doesn't mean that you know everything. It doesn't mean you have perfect fruit yet. You're still growing. But it does mean that you do what you're told. And likewise, if you are an employee and you have a boss, can you not be a faithful employee? Well, I think that the answer to that is yes. I mean, there are many employees out there who their bosses would consider them faithful. Why? Because they do everything that they, they're asked to do. They don't argue with their boss. They don't put up a fight. They don't just go off and, and do what they want to do. No, when their boss asks them to do something, they do it, meaning they're faithful. And just like in a marriage relationship, can a spouse be faithful to, to their spouse? Well, absolutely, yes. This is definitely possible for you to be faithful. And just like that, it doesn't mean like, let's say, when you first get married. It doesn't mean that you know everything that pleases your spouse. It doesn't mean that you, that you know everything about your spouse and, and what he or she likes and dislikes and all that. It just means that you're faithful to him or her. It means that you're not going out and cheating on him. It means that you're caring for your spouse, you're loving your spouse in, in the best way that you know how. Now, it may not be the way they want or are expecting, but that's that comes with knowledge. That comes with knowing your spouse, learning about your spouse, uh, how they want to be loved and, and honored and all that. 
this comes with growth, but it's possible even if you've only been married for a couple of months, it's possible to be faithful to your spouse, even though you're not perfect in the sense that you're doing everything they, they, they want you to do because you may not know everything. Just like, just like a new employee. Would you rather have a new employee who is faithful in all things, who does whatever you ask him to do, anything, doesn't argue, doesn't talk back, doesn't go off and do his own thing, whatever you want him to do, he does. But let's say he's only been there a couple months. He doesn't know the job, but he's faithful, and he's going to learn. You can teach him. Would you rather have this employee, or would you rather have an employee who has been with the company for 20, 30 years and never does what you tell him? You can't count on him. He's unfaithful. Well, I think the clear answer is you'd want the employee who you can train, who even though he's not perfect at his job yet, you can train, and he will become perfect. He will become mature and skilled at his job but at least he's faithful right now. And I think that's how we need to look at it. We may not have perfect knowledge. We may not know everything of what the Bible teaches, but everything we know we're supposed to be doing, we should be doing. There's still room for growth, but being faithful to God means everything you know God wants you to do, whatever knowledge you have, whatever light you have, you're walking in that light. So the question is, can you be faithful to God? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. If you can be faithful uh, faithful to your spouse, if you can be faithful to your parents, if you can be faithful to your boss, then why can't you be faithful to God? Of course you can be faithful to God, especially if you have the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as I'm going to show you, there are many places in the Bible where there are considered to be faithful people. But the opposite of faithful is unfaithful, or as James puts it, he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. And he says this just because they're, they're friends with the world. That's it. That's, that's all it takes for you to become an enemy of God or an adulterer or an adulteress. See, this is the opposite of faithful. So if you can be faithful, that means you can be unfaithful. You can be an adulterer. And a lot of times the Bible describes our relationship to God in the terms of a marital type of relationship. It talks about how if we go off into sin or we go off into the world, we're adulterers and adulteresses. So if, 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 if we can go off into sin and be adulterers and adulteresses, and this implies that we can also not be adulterers and adulteresses, or another way of putting this is we can be faithful. And some people say, well, we can't keep God's commandments because God, Jesus set the bar way too high, said even if you look at a woman with lust or uh, you hate someone in your heart, then uh, you know you you'll go to hell. So th there's no way that anybody can do that. They argue. So Jesus never intended for us to do that. He just wanted to show us that we can't do it, so that we can just rest in Him, trust in His works and what He did, and we don't have to do that. We can just believe in Him, and all that's covered. Well, that, no, that's not what the Bible says. No, Jesus meant what He said. If He told us to do something, it means that He is going to give us the power to do it. It means we can do it. So. Right here, if that's true, that you can't live in such a way that would be considered faithful to God, or that you can live in such a way that's pleasing to God, well, what about 1 John 3.22, where John says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because, because why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do you see that? We ask, we ask for something, and we get it. Because why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Yes, you can live in such a way that's honoring to God, that's pleasing to God, or that's faithful to God. Now, like I said earlier, there is a growth in fruit of the Spirit, and actually one of the fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness. This word can actually be translated as either faith or faithfulness. So a lot of times in the Bible, when you see the word faith, it can just as easily be translated as faithfulness, just like right here in Galatians 5, 22. The, the King James translates this as just faith, but New King James and other translations translate it as faithfulness. You see, they're so intertwined. That's how we need to be thinking about it. Can you be faithful? Well, yes, that's a fruit of the Spirit, and we can grow in this. This is something that um, you, you can be loving, but become more loving, just like you can love your spouse, but yet become 
more loving to your spouse, or you can have peace, but then have more peace or more faithfulness, um, these sorts of things. So, but let me just go ahead and say right up front that um, a lot of people's fruit out there that, that come on my channel or even holiness preachers has been absolutely rotten, stinky, disgusting fruit. I'll just go ahead and say that. even from even from many holiness preachers out there, the fruit that I've been seeing has been terrible, awful. I mean, with a lot of people, you don't see long suffering, for example. You don't see long suffering. A lot of times it's just they'll cast you off just one thing they disagree with and, and that's that. You know, and I'm talking about true brothers and sisters in the Lord, people who you know are are true brothers and sisters, been filled with the Spirit, who um who you know are walking in the light, and they treat them this way. Just no long suffering, just cast them off, just shun them for any little difference they have of opinion or what they think the Bible says. There's also an immense lack of love, a huge lack of love and gentleness. Yeah, did you know the Bible actually commands, it's a fruit of the Spirit, but we're to pursue these things, gentleness. And yes, I have a video that I'm going to post down below. These are things that we must pursue. These don't just, uh, I've heard of a lot of pastors preach that, well, these things just automatically happen. No, they don't automatically necessarily happen. These are all things we have to pursue. In fact, every one of these fruits of the Spirit, you can find a verse where it's commanded that you pursue these things or uh, put these things on, you know, go after these things. So I'm going to post that down below. Please check that out. But yes, we have to pursue these things. These don't just happen. We have to seek after uh, and pursue all these, okay? So uh, please check that out. But yes, a lot of people's fruit out there is just is either just non-existent or just rotten. And listen, this is one of the ways you can tell if someone is a Christian. Remember Jesus said, you'll know them by their what? Their fruit. Well, that has to mean, at least in some respect, fruit of the Spirit. So if they if they have the Spirit, they, they should have these fruits. If they don't have these fruits, then do they have the Spirit? Well, it's kind of like Jude says, that these are men who cause divisions devoid of the Spirit. So guys, I, I just want to encourage you, because this isn't talked about a lot. In fact, I, I can't think of any videos that I've ever seen among any holiness preacher ever that, that I can think of where they've done a video on the fruit of the Spirit. It's just not talked about. And, and this is why you see so many holiness preachers and so many people in this community who lack, who have a severe lack of the fruit of the Spirit. They treat their brothers and sisters like garbage. And friends, this needs to stop. This, Listen, God willing, I want to start talking about this more, and because this is a big ep epidemic. Um, we, we need to be patient and loving and gentle with our brothers and sisters. L listen, I'm not talking about just, her just any heretic that comes along and tries to stir stuff up and stir the pot. I'm talking about true brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially we we especially we need to be we need to be fearful that we're not showing them love and, and the fruit of the spirit. We we need to be scared because this is how we're going to be judged. So if, if if there's brothers and sisters out there that you're doing this to, repent, stop it, and learn to pursue these things. Okay, but but right here we see many times in the Bible that they're like in Colossians one two. It says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. So right here, Paul seems to believe that there is such a thing called faithful brethren. So yes, we can be faithful. This is, this is what we need to be looking at, is again, can we be faithful? Well, Paul says so. Right here in Colossians 1.7, Epaphras, Paul calls a faithful minister of Christ. And right here, Colossians 4.7, uh, I think it's Tachicus. Or Tachicus, uh, a beloved brother, faithful minister. Did you catch that? Look, just, just as we go through this, look at all these people who Paul says can be faithful. And then we're going to look and see what Jesus uh, and, and Peter say as well. But Onesimus, he calls a faithful and beloved brother. Silvanus says, our faithful brother, as I consider him. And Timothy, he calls a faithful son 
in the Lord. If it's not possible to be faithful to God, and like it says for the condition of deacons' wives, then why are there people called faithful? And why does it say that uh, deacons' wives must be faithful in all things? That's a requirement for them to serve as the wives of deacons. So it, it, it wouldn't be a requirement if it wasn't possible. And we wouldn't see all these people being called faithful if it wasn't possible to be faithful. And we see in 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He considered Paul faithful. And then right here, he told Timothy to commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And in Acts 16.15, Lydia said, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. In 1 Corinthians 4.2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul writes to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You see this. In Ephesians 6.21, uh, here, here it is again, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. And we see in Hebrews 3.2, Moses also was faithful in in all his house. Do you see this? In all his house. Just like Jesus was faithful, Moses was also faithful in all his house. And in Titus 1.6, it says, if a man is blameless, blameless, that means you can't be blamed for anything. The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. See, right here, we see that you can be a faithful child. And the context of this is being faithful in the sense that you're not accused of dissipation or insubordination. And James 1.12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, we can endure temptation, we can not become adulteresses and adulterers, and therefore be faithful. And then Jesus, what does Jesus say? In Matthew 25, 21, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, why was he faithful? Because he produced a return on his talents and minutes. That's why he was considered faithful. He, he, he put to work what he was given, just like Jesus commanded him, just like a good servant or a good steward. That's what a, that's what a good servant or steward does, is he's faithful with what God's given him. Just like that, that's, that's what we need to be like. So, you absolutely can be faithful, according to Paul, James, Jesus. And then look at this, Luke 16. Jesus says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. So it's talking about, very clearly, salvation. And he says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Again, talking about salvation. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? And listen to this. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So, what he's essentially saying is, you, you'll either be faithful to one and unfaithful to the other. It, it, see, you're serving somebody. You're either serving sin or you're serving righteousness. You're either serving God or you're serving Satan. You, you can't be serving both, so you have to pick. Who are you going to be faithful to? That, that's essentially what faith boils down to. Who, so who are you going to put your faith in? Well, who, who are you going to be faithful to? That's another way of putting it. Just like right here, again, the context of salvation being received into an everlasting home, that's the eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God, salvation, and it's dependent upon if you're faithful with, again, unrighteous mammon, and, and you've made friends for yourself with unrighteous mammon, and he says, listen, you have to pick. Are you going to be faithful to God, or are you going to be faithful to mammon? Right here, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household. See, Jesus says that there can be such thing as a faithful and wise steward. 
to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Um, and then you can read the rest of this, but he very clearly says, and, and you know, and the, he contrasts this with an unfaithful servant, one who who drinks and and gets drunk and beats his fellow servants. This would be considered an unfaithful servant. And then in Psalms 101.6, my eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way. Here's that word. See, a lot of people get uh, really nervous about this word, perfect. But again, it, it depends on what you mean by it. It depends, do you mean perfect in the sense of fully mature? Because you, you can be you can be faithful. Now, now hear me, hear me closely. You can be faithful, but not mature. Does that make sense? You so you can be doing everything God wants you to do, just like just like a new employee. He he doesn't know the job, but you can be faithful with what you do know, even if you don't know the entire job. And it's the same thing with us. We can be faithful, but yet not mature. We we can be faithful, but not yet have full knowledge. We can be faithful, but not yet have grown to maturity in the fruits of the Spirit. Now, again, it doesn't mean that if you demonstrate a, a lack of fruit of the Spirit, that, that that means you're saved. No, that's the evidence. You, you have to have fruits of the Spirit, um, but you can grow in these. You can increase in these, just like 2 Peter 1 talks about. Please check that out. But um, but yeah, you, you, you can be faithful and, and not be mature. And that's another word for perfect. A lot of people get tripped up on the word perfect, but another word for perfect is, another meaning for it is mature. So think about it like that. Okay, e even if you're not perfect in the sense of being fully mature, let's say, let's say maybe you're a newer Christian or you just haven't progressed, can you be faithful? Well, yes, absolutely. And you can be perfect once you're mature. It, but you you can be perfect in the sense that, um, that that you're walking in everything you know, or at least you can be faithful. And then once you grow to maturity, your 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 fruit, you can be perfect or complete or mature. Then right here, when we get to Revelation, this is very interesting because Jesus specifically says he he calls out people for being faithful and exhorts them to be faithful. So obviously it's got to be possible, or he wouldn't say these things. But listen to this. He says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Friends, that's salvation. It's talking about being faithful for salvation's sake. And I think that a lot of people understand faithfulness a whole lot more than they might understand um, something like like perfection. Because everybody understands these relationships. Everybody understands you can be faithful to your spouse. They, they, they automatically, intuitively seem to know what that entails. They automatically seem to know what it means to be faithful to your boss. Okay, these aren't, this isn't cryptic. Everybody just knows this. Everybody knows what it means to be a faithful son or daughter. So again, perfection can have a sort of baggage to it, sort of misunderstanding, but Faithfulness is something that I, I don't think is really easy to, to, to mix up. It's not really easy to misunderstand. Everybody understands this, what it means to be faithful. And they understand that you can be faithful in relationships. Then in Revelation 2.13, Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Did you catch that? He calls him his faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And he commends them for holding fast to his name and not denying his faith. See, this is being faithful. Yes, we can actually do this. People in the Bible have done this, have been faithful stewards, good and faithful servants. So we can too. Jesus wouldn't command us to do something that we couldn't do. If, if he's going to call us to do something, if he's going to command us to do something, he's going to give us the power, the resources, the ability, the uh, equipping to do it. 
In fact, in, in uh, I believe it's 1 Peter, it says that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. So then we see in Revelation 3, 4, Jesus says, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Well, so what does this mean? They, they haven't soiled their garments. That means they've been what? Faithful, yes. That means they've been faithful. They haven't defiled their clothes, which means they've stayed clean. Think about somebody who has tripped and fallen in the mud. See, remember in Jude, it says that God is able to keep us from stumbling. But in that same chapter, in the same book of Jude, it says we have to keep ourselves in the love of God. We have to pray. Now, in Revelation 3, Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key to David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Remember how James says you have to persevere in order to get the crown of life? He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, what's interesting is Jesus rebukes five out of the seven churches. He has John write to seven churches. And did you know there were two churches where he didn't have anything bad to say, any rebuke towards them? He said things like, hold fast, you've kept, the, kept my faith. He didn't have anything bad to say about, for example, the church in Philadelphia. Right here, he says, you've kept my command um, to persevere, uh, hold fast to what you have. So he, he, he's not saying, hey, you guys need to repent. In fact, remember when Jesus talks about how he leaves the 99 to go after the one lost sheep, he says that the 99, they need no repentance. That, that means that there's nothing they need to repent over because they're with God. They're walking in the light. They're walking with Jesus. They're, they're being faithful. And just like that, there are two churches in Revelation 2 and 3 where Jesus doesn't rebuke them. I mean, think about it. He had critiques or things that, that, that they needed rebuked on for the other five churches, but he said nothing. That means that it's possible to, yes, walk in such a way that's pleasing to God, where, where he doesn't have anything bad to say. Because, listen, a lot of people out there, especially free gracers, but a lot of people even in, the, in, in Protestantism, what they try to do is they try to make you feel that you're sinning Every single second of the day, just, just you know, you can't help it. Everything you do is sin. And they make it almost so bad that you just want to give up and just say, well, you know, I just, I just believe in Jesus, and that's all I got to do. And, and that's really the goal of the devil, is to just say, well, since you can't please him anyways. But look, right here, you can absolutely please God. You, you can live, in fact, you can live in such a way where if Jesus came back right now, he wouldn't have anything bad to say about you. Think about that. He could actually tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. Just like the, the church in Philadelphia. If, I, I mean, think about it. Would this be you? If he came to you today, would he tell you, uh, hold fast to what you have, um, you, you've kept my command to persevere? Would he tell you these sorts of things? Or like the five churches that he rebuked, would he tell you things that you're doing wrong, sins that you're committing, uh, false doctrines that you're embracing? Would he rebuke you for those things, like eternal security, faith alone, or the doctrine of the, of the Nicolaitans? 
This is very interesting because this proves that you can, you can please God, you can be faithful, you can live in such a way that's considered faithful to God. And then lastly, in Revelation 17, 14, it says, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Did you catch that? Faithful. Now, friends, are you? this is what you should ask. Ask yourself, are you faithful to God? Now, now without qualifying it with, well, yeah, but, I mean, think about it. If it's possible to be faithful to your spouse, if it's possible to be faithful to your parents, if it's possible to be faithful to your employer, to your boss, and we see numerous times where people are called faithful. Jesus says, good, well done, good and faithful. Notice how he says, well done, good and faithful servant. For Why? Because he dealt well with what he was given by God. And we see examples of people being called faithful. And we see right here that those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So why is it we couldn't be faithful to God? Well, we absolutely can be faithful to God. I think this is more than enough proof. Uh, Please check out that video. And if you have any questions, please drop them down below. Uh, Just reach out. Just say something to me. Um, Just anything you want, just please like, subscribe. It helps get this message out there. People need to hear this. That's all I got for today. God bless.